and welcome back. In the previous videos, we've built and tested a new register and backplane design, a sequencer, and an incrementer. And along the way, we even ran some rudimentary microcode for a simple instruction. But today, we're going to be making memories, and I do mean that in the plural sense, because I'm thinking about two or even more memory options for this Relay computer. And at this point, I would normally start with a chapter called Why Do We Need Memory? But unlike incrementers and sequencers, I think the need for memory is pretty common knowledge and straightforward, as we just need a place large enough to store programs that we want to run on the Relay computer. In the previous video, I mentioned that I was going to go in two different directions for the memory. So let's start with some old school memory. And by this, I just mean that it's the type of memory that would have existed in the 1940s or 50s when relay computers were more popular. In my search, I came across this amazing book that was published in 1955. And it contains this chapter that explains mercury delay lines, cathode ray tube memory, and diode capacitor memory. Now I also looked at magnetic core memory and that's just because I happen to have some here. And this is a slice of a larger core stack from a 1970s Soviet PDP clone that I found on eBay. But after a bit of tinkering, I found that the concepts of how this memory works would require some very complex circuits that can sense these cores flipping states and that would also apply to delay lines and CRT memory. But I do know that capacitor diode memory has potential, and that's just because it's already being used in other computer projects out there. And this concept is just based on the fact that a capacitor can hold a charge, and that would represent one bit of information. So if we add a couple of diodes to the mix, we can effectively control the flow of data in and out of that capacitor. I've created this simple 1-bit capacitor memory to demonstrate this concept. On the top board, we have our storage capacitor, which is the star of this show. And on the top of that, we have our two diodes that control the flow of current to and from this capacitor. To the right, we have a relay that simply gates a read operation output to the data bus. The bottom board contains our controls for the read, write, and clear functions of our 1-bit memory. And on the far right is the massive 1-bit data bus. And as usual, when the LED is not lit, it represents a 0. And if it's on, it represents a 1. So we'll start by putting a 1 on the data bus. And when I do this, the data is not stored anywhere until I press the right button. And this redirects the data bus value to charge the capacitor. Now that the capacitor is charged, we can use the read button to access it. And this button simply grounds this relay, allowing the capacitor to activate it and supply a voltage to the 1-bit data bus. Note that when the read button is pressed, the output is momentary, and that's because the capacitor is discharged each time the read is performed. On this circuit, we can regenerate or recharge the capacitor when a read function is engaged by using this unused side of the gating relay. We can supply voltage to the common pin and link the normally open to the write line. This will rewrite the value of the capacitor each time it is read. Now that we have a value of 1 stored in our capacitor, let's try to overwrite it with a 0. Ideally, we would just perform a write with a 0 on the data bus. However, this doesn't work here since a write is simply providing 0 volts to a capacitor that's already charged. So we need to create an explicit clear function, and this simply discharges the capacitor to ground, leaving it cleared for the next write cycle. Now let's talk about a more modern memory option, and that's this 32K static RAM chip. And we'll start with the datasheet for this chip which is a 62256N, and this is the same RAM chip that was used by Dr. Porter and Paul Law in their relay computers. On the next page, we can see that it has 16 address input pins, 8 data I.O. pins, and of course, our voltage and ground pins. 
But where it gets interesting is the write enable and the output enable pins. If we want to write a value to memory, we would take the write enable pin low, or in other words, ground. If we want to read a value from memory, we set it to high with 5 volts. And next is the output enable pin, and this controls whether the data I.O. pins are inputs during a write or outputs during a read. And finally, the chip enable pin. And this would only be disabled if we were going to use more than 32K of memory, which is, well, not really necessary for this relay computer. So here's a finished circuit that I've put together that hopefully demonstrates how we would read or write values to this static RAM chip. And I'll start with this DPDT relay that is activated by this push button here. When the circuit is idle, this relay is setting the RAM chip write enable pin to high and the output enable pin to low. And this puts the RAM chip in a default read mode. But when we press this button, the relay is energized, which then reverses those signals and puts the chip into write mode. And next to this relay, we have these dip switches. And this one is wired to the first four address lines on the RAM chip, whereas this one is tied to the first four data lines on the RAM chip. And I've also connected those data lines to this LED indicator, and this is just so we can see the data values as they're being read or written to the chip. Now, note that I've only wired up four bits for each of these, and that's simply to reduce the number of wires I need to run. And you can see I'm no Ben Eater when it comes to wiring my breadboards, but it gets the job done for now. And you can also see that we have these pull-down resistors that are tied to the unused address and data lines from the IC. And without these in place, IC pins will sometimes kind of float between states of 0 and 1, and I understand that this is due to their high impedance. And I'll also point out this decoupling capacitor here that sits between the voltage in and the ground. And this just reduces noise or voltage ripples that can cause issues or even damage integrated circuits. So now that we have this built, let's add some power and take this board for a test drive. Once there's power, we can see that there's some data already being displayed, and that's just because the circuit defaults to a read state, and this value, which is located at memory address zero, was just some random value in the RAM at the time it was powered on. So I'll start by switching our 4-bit address bus to 1000. And when I do that, we can see that the data value has changed. And if I continue on and switch to 0100, it's just showing that we're reading whatever values are stored in these locations in the RAM chip. So let's write a new value to the chip. I'll set the address back to 0000 and we'll create a data value of 1111 and then press the write button. And this engages the relay and flips the state of the write enable and the output enable pins. We can set the data switches back to all zeros and see that the value being read from address zero is the new data value that we just wrote to that address. We can now select another memory address and do the same thing but let's select a different data value so that we can see the difference. There's now a different value written to address 1000, and when we toggle between this and address 0, we read the correct values we wrote to each of these addresses. This is our 32K static RAM chip, and in an easier world, we could just wire the address bus and the data bus directly to this chip and call it a day. But we have to consider that in our relay computer, voltages and currents aren't always precise. And in addition, this chip's output lines are not designed to drive relays directly. To solve this, we can introduce an 8-line Darlington array, and this will isolate the memory chip from the common power supply voltage. But this array only works in one direction, so this method will be used for data output only. Now we can tackle getting the data and addresses into the memory chip. So we'll use a 5 volt regulator 
and a new set of data input relays that will ensure that the memory data I.O. inputs are never greater than 5 volts at any time. And when we do the same for the address bus, our sensitive memory chip will now be safely power isolated and can still function with the relay computer. Quick overview of the Arduino setup here. On the left, we have the relays that are responsible for the control lines. And in the middle, these ones are responsible for the address lines. And this one on the right is responsible for the data lines. Reading back the values to the Arduino is not always reliable. So I'm going to be visually checking the data values. And to make this easier, I'm going to apply a bitwise not operator against the address value to produce a data value. We now have a memory that we can work with to start running some programs, but I am going to keep building the capacitor memory just because I think it would be so cool to get that working. And at this point, we're really close to being able to run a program. We've already built a rudimentary clock in the sequencer episode, and the program counter we need is really just another register, so that will be a very quick build. But I'm not sure yet about the designs for the controller and the instruction decoder. So I think my next step is to create a prototyping board that would allow me to more easily experiment with new designs before ordering the PCBs. So with that, thank you so much for watching and also a huge thank you to everyone who subscribed because reaching this milestone is a huge motivator. And it also means that it's finally time for me to invest in a real camera. So hopefully that means an even 
better and less fuzzy experience for you as well. So thanks again. Keep pinging me in the comments and see you in the next episode.